Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, Y Whales, wherever in the world you are today. It's my favorite thing about, uh, you know, kind of Web3 as an asset class is we can talk to anyone in the world instantaneously, except for this whole time zone thing. Um, kind of screws up, you know, day, days and nights and, and whatnot, but we'll get around it. Um, so today is uh, October 27th, and we're kind of heading, you know, again, clearly into a bear market. Uh, it was a lot more fun uh, last year, Yanni. I'm sure we all remember kind of, you know, you could, it was, throw anything at the dartboard and it was going to go up, just it was going to go up more than the thing next to it. Um, and so here we are kind of really in a, uh, you know, rebuilding phase. Uh, I, I see a lot of amazing projects being kind of rebuilt, rethought of, um, and technology maturing extremely fast. And when you're talking about an asset class like Web3 moving fast, I mean, that means it's moving at, you know, essentially uh, already today, four and a half times the the traditional speed of the stock market. So it never sleeps, it never closes, there's no holiday hours or anything else. So your rate of innovation is just so much faster because you can never take any time off. Um, and my guest today knows more about that than anyone I think on the planet um, as as the founder and CEO of, of uh, eToro. So Yanni, before we uh, kind of dive into everything that eToro does, can we kind of go back a little bit and uh, how you got here today? Sure. So f first, thank you very much for having me. Uh, uh, pleasure uh, being on the uh, Y Whales uh, podcast. Um, and uh, so a bit about myself. Uh, I, I sort of got bit by capital markets bug very early on. I started trading the markets when I was 13. Uh, my father was a CEO and a founder of a publicly listed company. So we always used to talk about the markets growing up. And I started my career as a programmer. So I did my first and second degrees in computer sciences. Uh, and everything was always for me around the markets, right? So algo trading, uh, looking at sort of the infrastructure of markets. So always passionate about finance, markets, technology, uh, uh, the economy. Um, and when we started brainstorming about the concept of eToro, I co-founded eToro with my older brother, Ronin, and he comes from an industrial design background. And he used to always make uh, a sort of uh, fun of me that I have uh, an accountant fetish. I, I look at screens, multiple screens all day with Excels open and the newspaper. And, and, and that was really how we started eToro was to try and hack the user experience, to build something that opens the markets for everyone to trade and invest in a simple and transparent way. So for me, it was always about getting into the markets. And I always say there are three technologies that sort of for me were aha moment. Uh, and that is the first time I, I traded stocks, sort of understanding how capital markets work. Uh, when I first, and this was uh, now I feel old, uh, when I used BBS as an old modems to connect to the internet and sort of figured out the beautiful thing about the internet that everybody's connected to one another, right? Very similar to the concept of capital markets. And then the aha moment in 2010, when uh, I discovered uh, Bitcoin and Satoshi's white paper and sort of figured out this is really how eventually financial technology should work. You know, and, and I absolutely love so much about that. So let's unpack a few things real quick before we go forward. Number one, um, you know, having that kind of education at such a young age, because you, it was, you know, a family business uh, at that point to be running or involved in a publicly traded company. Um, and so the things you hear around the dinner table, the things that, you know, when you ask questions or, um, you know, in my case, when, when, when my dad, I came from a family business as well of retailers. Um, so I just kind of, you're, it's ingrained in you so early um, that it provides that, that early life lens is that when most kids are in college and they're getting their first exposure to those financial markets and you've already been trading, you already understand the ins and outs. Um, it must've been a really dynamic experience, you know, for you to kind of be the mature one in the room, you know, when you got to kind of college level, uh, courses. So, so definitely the fact that, you know, I got educated early on, on finance and the markets and sort of running, uh, uh, in the family, my actually my grandfather was also a, a Swiss banker. Uh, uh, is is a big part of sort of who I am and sort of my passion towards capital markets and also part of of, of what Itoro is because I'm a very big believer in the markets, in capital markets, and in the fact that people need to be educated about how to invest their money 
uh, and what to do with their money in the markets. Uh, so, so again, it's, it's a big part of who I am is being in the markets and helping others participate in the markets. And, and for that purpose, by the way, I think Web3 or crypto markets are just another subset of sort of the entire sort of capital markets and money markets around the world. Yeah. And, and, you know, the thing that really got me to convert, you know, full time from being, you know, I, I was never a big stock trader. Um, but the thing that converted me from, from stocks to, to blockchain cryptocurrency kind of as a, as a full time deal was the level of transparency. Um, you know, one of the things that, that I generally was despised about the stock market is you can do all your research. You can look at any, you know, watch every TV program you want, you know, have uh, MSNBC or whatever, whatever's scrolling 24 seven, like every chart on the books across the board, you make your bets, you say, I'm good, I feel comfortable about investing in the stock. And then the next day later, they, 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 uh, you know, they dilute you, they dilute you, they do another round, they do something. And it was just like, you know, the, the rules just constantly changed. And it was so against, you know, kind of that retail trader. <clears throat> and then here you have over in blockchain that it's transparent, you can see who's leveraging, you can see who's, who's shorting, you can see, you know, kind of where things are going in and out. And, and so I love, um, you know, hearing your perspective as someone that truly does understand the financial markets um, and, and to hear your excitement about moving over to blockchain. What's been kind of your biggest takeaway of uh, trying to compare the two, you know, from a obfuscated system of stocks to a clear and transparent blockchain? So, so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start a little a bit talking about eToro because I, I, I think that sort of resonates and connects. So what is eToro? Uh, uh, eToro is uh, the world's largest uh, social investment platform. We're a social network of investors where everything is actually transparent. So we have 30 million registered user uh, who, uh, when they open an account, can actually see each other profiles and see our traders' performance uh, and their actual portfolio location. So the concept of eToro is exactly what you described. How do we bring more transparency into the market? So when you open a brokerage account in eToro where you can trade stocks and crypto, people automatically publish their performance and their portfolio location. You don't know how much money they have in their account, but you can actually see millions of people's real accounts with a real performance over time. So when I used to trade the markets when I was in high school and I went to Yahoo groups and Raging Bull and people were talking about stocks, I, I never really knew who were those people, right? Everything was sort of anonymous and I couldn't really know what they're doing, whether they're actually honest about uh, their trading activity. And that sort of led us to build eToro and figure out that in order for people to get educated and become successful investors, they need that transparency in the markets to be able to see what other people are doing. Then the really unique sort of technology we developed is also you can either trade on your own or you can see someone's performance and say, I just want to copy him with $1,000 or $5,000. So uh, and that copies his entire portfolio to your allocated amount. And every time he trades, it trades automatically in your account. So sort of from day one prior to Bitcoin, we were always su super excited about bringing in transparency into capital markets and into currency markets, into trading. Then when we, when we founded eToro in 2007, we came into a sort of the global financial crisis. And, and then I had a really terrible experience, uh, a, a sort of a, a negative aha moment. If the previous ones was positives, this is one of the negatives which is I actually remember going sort of when the end finished, uh, when the day finished, we were actually questioning whether our money in the bank in the next day is going to be there. And we had to distribute. This was like very early on uh, of the company, but already launched accepting customer deposits, putting those customer deposits, segregated bank accounts, and suddenly when Lehman Brothers collapsed, you know, after Burns Stearns, it was like nothing worked, right? So it was almost like I saw somebody unplugging the system. The, you didn't have quotes uh, for currencies, right? Spreads were going wild. And, and, and this was like in every very large financial crisis, you have this sort of 
feeling that somebody's unplugging the system to to save themselves right you have it in the 90s uh, uh sort of uh, people uh, not answering uh people on the brokerage side because they don't want people to sort of panic and sell and they don't know what to do but i i felt that on a technology level right i felt how the banks are sort of unplugging the system um and i i thought it's crazy i thought that you know when i thought about the currency markets the fact that the euro and the dollar and the pound and the yen could be sort of almost frozen where money you need to wake up to the next morning to figure out whether you can access money in the bank that was for me like an aha moment that the current financial services stack doesn't work it, it doesn't make sense for it to close at five o'clock it doesn't make sense for it to it should be 24 7. your assets should be your own you should be have access to them and transfer them uh and and, and trading the markets shouldn't be controlled by just very few players who can unplug the system and actually back then i started writing about it uh the need uh, I called it uh, 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 the need for the visible hand uh, uh, about the fact that we need a transparent money system where you can actually see how money flows. And I, I dubbed it back then the good dollar. Um, and I said, like, we, we need a different economic framework so things are transparent because if money was transparent, the, the game would be eventually fairer. Uh, uh, and better for everyone. Uh, so I've been, you know, passionate about exactly, Jay, what you described very early on and, and prior, uh, uh, even to Bitcoin, which is why, again, when I saw Bitcoin, I was like, this is how things should really work. Yeah. And, and I, I mean, that's a fabulous explanation and, and history of, of how it exists today. Um, you know, one of the things I think most people don't recognize, and if you want to kind of comment, you know, quickly on is, you know, how broken tradition, the, the traditional, uh, you know, kind of stock market or traditional economies are. I mean, they, these things are running on servers that in some cases were installed in the 80s. Uh, you still have dial up modems installed in the entire systems. And so to, to me, and this is my personal opinion, blockchain represents the first upgrade uh, of a true, you know, global financial, uh, you know, kind of accounting system that does have transparency, does have safeguards, does have trust, um, which is something that we've seen time and time again, that, that is, does not work in the hands of private companies that, that you know, they are uh, behooven to, to, you know, worry about their bottom line, uh, not about their, their clients in some cases. And I, I know that everyone has a fiduciary responsibility, um, but that doesn't always translate, um, you know, because if an audit takes six months, them unplugging the system for a day or two to figure out what's next um, doesn't help the clients, it helps the company. So, so uh, funny enough, yesterday I, I gave a lecture called From Bitcoin to the Metaverse uh, to uh, a, a group of executives uh, from one of the uh, largest banks in the world. And, and I told them the story, and again, you need to, in my view, blockchain technology is, is the future of not only finan financial services, technology stack for sure, but of the digital representation of assets and goods eventually, right? Which we'll probably talk about NFTs a bit later on as well. And I think a lot of people don't understand because it looks like it's working when you operate with a, a mobile app of a bank, but you're right. Uh, in Israel, uh, all of the big banks work on, on uh, 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 servers from the 80s written in COBOL, that's the backbone uh, of the Israeli banking system. And again, and it's a very local ecosystem. Every country where we operate, we have customers from 100 different countries. We found out that every country has like five players or maybe 10 players who control all of the pipes and all of the infrastructure, and they're very traditional. And you go all the way back to sort of the basics when you people speak about T plus one, T plus two settlements, which take yeah. days, whether it's currency, right? You, you move money, right? If you remove fintech, if you move money in traditional banks, it, it could settle in, in days. Uh, if you have shares in one country and you move want to move them to a bank in another country, it could take weeks. Um, and, and the reason for that is, and very much related to, again, the concept of 
in the name blockchain, uh, uh, which is when my grandfather used to run his bank in the 60s, uh, and I love telling this story, uh, he told me once, uh, uh, to, I tried to figure out how do you run a bank without computers, right? So you, you think today of running a bank without a computer system, it's mind boggling. So you had people, right, account managers that register into a ledger, uh, a transaction. Then you had a branch manager at the end of the day, basically collecting all of the ledgers of the account managers, creating a ledger of the branch. You then have somebody with a motorcycle going to all of the branches, collecting all of the ledgers to the main branch, creating the ledger of the internal bank and the ledger of the bank with the four other big banks right so which is why you you couldn't even have if you had a hundred banks you needed to have hundred you know somebody with the motorcycle going all around so yeah. the system was very centralized back then but that defined what today in the banking industry is the t plus one so in order for you to consolidate your blocks in traditional banking system things still work at t plus one t plus two t plus three which is exactly like uh, transactions in crypto, right? You're told to wait for six confirmations uh, on the blockchain. That's yeah. T plus one, two, three, four, five, six. The difference is in Ethereum, it's 15 seconds. In traditional finance, it's still counted in days. And I think yeah. moving from something, moving technology from something that works today in, in days as a time frame to uh, something that could work uh, in seconds uh, and moving to a world where locally there are only five or 15 players that can work on that ecosystem versus uh, a, an ecosystem that can have hundreds of millions of people connected to it. That moves the needle to, again, I don't think we've even seen yet the beginning uh, of of where this new financial system can take us, and it's, it's going to take a while as well. Yeah, I, I mean, there's so much that that Yanni you have witnessed. I mean, you've been around and you witnessed Web One. Um, you know, obviously saw the evolution of Web Two, and now you're helping to build Web Three. And um, one of the things I love, and and I want to circle back to another thing you do, which is the transparency of the traders. Um, I have to say, the world would be a very different place if every single person that went on TV, every person that wrote an article and said, "Hey, here's investment advice," that next to their name um, and what station they are, they had a percentage of how they did over the last, you know. Uh, 90 days, six months, one, two, What you're saying years. is do you, you think anybody who's talking about the markets should have an eToro account uh, uh, and, and, and have all of their money in eToro so people can actually see what they're actually trading? I, I, listen, if, you can, if we can come up with a plugin, a uh, Chrome plugin that just overlays all that, I think that'd be perfect. Um, because I, I think that, you know, education and isolation is, is, you know, it's fabulous. And when you're by yourself, you can justify anything. Like I can do, you know, I'm horrible with, with TA. Um, I, can, I can justify any any of my trades um, by drawing enough lines and doing everything else but history is really where you you find this you know where do, where does this all fall out and you know it, there's a lot of great ideas. There's a lot of great thoughts and people are around, you know, and, and here and have, you know, amazing concepts, but actually when the rubber meets the road is all that matters in the financial market. You know, are you up or are you down? Um, what's been some of the good, some of the biggest success stories you've, you've seen with the uh, transparency and copy trading? So, so first of all, the, the biggest and most important lesson in, in trading and investing. And actually, I always have a challenge when I talk to sort of pure crypto players about this is diversification, yes. right? So modern portfolio theory, uh, 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 you know, from the 70s proved that if you have, if you want to achieve a high sort of uh, a reward portfolio, uh, uh, you can actually minimize the risk of that portfolio if you invest in uncorrelated assets. And if you want to invest in uh, uncorrelated assets, you should invest in both stock markets, different industries, different geographies, potentially commodities and crypto assets as well. And then also diversify probably within crypto. And I, I think the biggest you know, success stories we've seen is people who've learned that diversification on eToro. So during first crypto winter, not first, but the last crypto winter of 2017 and 18, we grew back then uh, from about, we were a $60 million revenue company 
and within uh, uh, basically really two months became a four hundred million dollar wow. revenue business. Uh, and that was like December 2017 and January 2018. Um, and that was like a huge influx. We grew from opening 200 accounts uh, roughly a day to 20,000 new funded accounts in a day in December, which was uh, great. We had the walls were moving back then in eToro. But then Crypto Winter came in and we saw something interesting. First, most of the retail investors didn't capitulate. They, they stayed and hodled their crypto over time, all the way to crypto rally uh, uh, 3.0 of 2021. Second, the successful ones who became popular investors, those are the ones being copied on eToro today. So out of 2.7 million brokerage accounts, there are one out of a thousand. So 2,700 popular investors who get paid to be copied, right? So you can yeah. become, you, you're a retail investor on eToro, you're doing well, suddenly people start copying you and you, you can get paid a million dollars a year for wow. just people copying your trading activity on eToro. And the ones that really were successful from one crypto winter to the next crypto rally, and now I think are going to be successful post also this crypto winter, are those who learn to diversify and sort of shift between asset classes. And there are a lot of stories. If you go into the popular investor program now, you can just sort of open it up, search and browse for people based on how much, uh, what's the percentage of gains that they did this year. And you'll see how different those are from those who were successful last year. So I think it's about looking at performance as a long-term play. It's not a short-term play. It's not about how much money did you do this year. It's how much money did you do over the last five years uh, and, and how does that look if you want to try and determine if somebody's good really at investing. So what you're saying is you've actually made real influencers that have real world value on, on the planet um, that, that you do want to follow. Um, I love that. I, I would love, can we get the, the number one and the, the last place person on a single podcast and talk to them both about By the, the way, success? We're, su we're super happy for, for, for you to interview popular investors on the podcast as well. Uh, it's hard, by the way, one of the also lessons learned, it's hard to rank them. Right. So yeah. uh, uh, it's because you can't really rank people based on short term gain. It's hard to rank people. It's like a very uh, a complex matrix to try and say who is really the best uh, of, of, of investors, because the question is, what do you measure? Risk, reward, diversification, one month, one year, two years, five years. Uh, so what we've learned is to enable people to find what's interesting for them uh, uh, on the platform uh, and to sort of open up choices for customers. I love that. So, so Yanni, one of the biggest questions I have, and, and I, I, my first Bitcoin purchase was uh, early 2010. So unlike you, uh, that you saw the value, I looked at it, I, I said, I want, I want to buy them. I bought, you know, a hundred of them for $20, thought it was super cool. Never knew anyone that even conceptualized what they were. When I upgraded the computer, I, I entirely forgot that they existed and didn't care. Um, but, but most importantly, did you actually lose them or not? Oh yeah, they're gone. Yeah. Long gone, long gone. It's so there's a hundred less in the world. No big deal. Uh, uh, yeah, um, I have exactly the same story, uh, uh, with, but but my computer was stolen. So okay. uh, another fifty bitcoins that disappeared. Yeah, but the reality was, like, I bought these things for a couple of cents. Um, had they hit, you know, five dollars, ten dollars, twenty dollars, like, I would have been gone. But the reality was, a lot of the people that got in very early, you know, the two thousand, you know, two thousand twelve, thirteen is kind of when most people started waking up because exchanges started to appear. Um, You've survived where we've seen some of the largest Bitcoin exchanges. There's entire movies around like just how volatile and how kind of unsecure uh, exchanges are. And here you are, you know, a, a, you know, over a decade at this point, almost, um, you know, operating in one of the most volatile asset classes that exist. Um, how, how have you survived and how have you grown and, and focused on security as well to, to your users? Because your brand is, is top notch. Um, so, so again, very similar to what I said uh, regarding sort of investors education about diversification. It's the diversification of the business, right? And diversification is is di always difficult because you know when you believe in something, you you want to 
go all in on it, or you need to you force yourself to diversify. And we've always been diversified from sort of the asset classes that we provide our customers. So last year, we did a $1.2 billion in revenues. 58% of that was crypto. This year, crypto is down now to 15% of revenues, wow. right? So it was 75% reduction in crypto volumes. But the company's still strong because we've seen commodities trading pick up this year, uh, because we've seen uh, uh, stock trading actually shorts pick up this year, right? So other financial instruments, to whether bear markets, inflationary markets, uh, have been very popular this year, while we're seeing sort of a tougher time for purely stock markets and crypto markets. And and we've seen that before. So this is only tour of the third crypto winter we're experiencing. We actually launched Bitcoin on eToro in 2000, uh, uh, end of 2013, which was just a second before Mt. Gox collapsed. And then for a while, nobody cared. Uh, until 2017, nobody cared about Bitcoin. I was like, we went to regulators. We had to explain to them what Bitcoin is, how to work with it. Why do we consider it a financial instrument? Like a whole saga and that eventually we launched it and nobody cared. And, and, and that also leads me to the other point of security. Since we're a regulated financial institution, we're a regulated brokerage, uh, we custody customer assets. We segregate mm -hmm. customer assets. You deposit $1,000 in eToro, that $1,000 sit in an account which is in trust for a client. It doesn't sit in eToro's bank accounts for eToro. It sits specifically in segregated customer accounts. When you buy stocks in eToro, that segregated customer assets where we're, we sub-custody stocks. So when we looked at crypto from day one, we had in place basically the structure of regulation, which is, you know, first, know your customer. Second is uh, make sure that uh, you know how to custody and segregate customer assets properly, which means you do it on a daily basis. So every day we custody and segregate and, and show that segregation of all of customer assets, cash, crypto, equities, derivatives, right? So from that point of view, while a lot of people in the industry um, sort of are a bit anti-regulation, um, the, the general sort of uh, directives of regulation are actually to protect consumers and usually are coming from a lot of bad experience with a lot of bad actors. Uh, uh, so as a regulated financial institution being regulated now in Europe, UK, Australia, Singapore, Abu Dhabi, US, you see sort of every all regulators thinking about sort of the same thing when they're thinking about protecting consumers. And, and I think that led eventually, you know, to, to high level of, you know, security uh, in eToro. Uh, yeah. Having said that, I think, there are good things about uh, uh, regulation, which is protecting consumers. And sometimes that shifts to protecting local companies. Um, and that part of sort of protective regulation is, is something very much against the sort of libertarian view of crypto, right? So the fact that sometimes regulators don't protect really consumers, uh, but they're trying uh, to sort of tell consumers not to do something uh, uh, or uh, protect sort of the local ecosystem in a world which is becoming very global, I, I think very rightfully so. We, we need better systems in place so we can really have a global economy that's open for, for investors from all around the world. I, I love that answer and I love that, that explanation because, you know, basically you you've, can say that not solely, but one of the reasons you survived is you did follow the regulations. You did follow the rules. Um, you never once believed that you were smarter than your clients or smarter than the regulatory, you know, regulatory bodies, which, you know, again, I, I think the SEC and, 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 you know, all these three letter agencies, you can absolutely like, there is a, a mountain 
of, of, you know, kind of things that they've done wrong. But at the core, the reason they exist is because um, the rugs and the scams and everything else that we deal with every single day in, the, in an unregulated crypto market um, were happening in, in the traditional stock markets and then traditional uh, investments all around the world. So we do need to have a level playing field and we do need to have people that are saying, hey, give me your capital. I promise to be a, you know, fiduciarily responsible for this. And they're not, you know, you, you as a consumer suddenly are going to really want someone like the SEC or the FCC or, or, you know, any DOJ to step in and say, Hey, 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 um, you, you broke, you broke the contract here. So what we're dealing with though, and I, I, I would love to hear your perspective, um, is really a lack of education. Uh, in the space right now. Um, I don't believe that most legislatures uh, around the world understand what blockchain is uh, at its core. Forget Bitcoin, forget Ethereum, forget, you know, all these other things. I don't believe that they even understand what a let, what an open ledger is and what blockchain technology does. Then you get into smart contracts, then you get into kind of, you know, Bitcoin and everything else. How, how do you educate, you know, your, your users to even understand what in the world this is? So f first of all, you know, m my belief, again, a libertarian view for education as well is the best way to educate yourself is by observing uh, uh, what others are doing and uh, communicating with others. Right. And that's the yeah. core of what eToro is. We're a social network. People come to invest in eToro. They go and buy Bitcoin or Ethereum or Dogecoin and they find a community we have 18 million people following Bitcoin on eToro talking about Bitcoin. So the best way for us to educate our customers is showing them the feed of Bitcoin and helping them find people they can talk to about what is Bitcoin, right? And that's in addition, of course, to huge amount of efforts and investments we're doing in educational materials and videos and tutorials in 20 different languages. But I think eventually it's really up to people to educate themselves. We need to give them the tools and access for them to, to educate themselves about various types of markets. I'd say, by the way, on, on reg regulators, that it's a complex problem, right? So regulators are local. They regulate local companies, local issuers of, of stocks. They have zero enforcement usually on global companies, like the entire infrastructure of a local regulator has been built to serve the local banking system, the local stock exchange, the local brokers and banks and investment managers. And when you think of something as global uh, 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 as crypto, uh, it becomes challenging because how you can, if, if, if we were and I think that's why it's taking time and longer than expected, not because necessarily gradually more regulators don't have the right sort of under technical understanding. Uh, I think it's because the global local nature uh, of crypto makes it, all, I would say, almost very, very hard to, to adapt or, or to create the right infrastructure. So we actually found out a lot of very smart people, like all regulators understand how transparency, real time and shortening, clearing and settlement periods improve uh, the financial system. Yeah. Uh, but to take it from that theory into, okay, how do we replace the current system? It is, it is a challenging task. Yeah, I mean, it, it is, um, it, it's so fun to play in this asset class because we're so early. And I'm, I'm sure that when you thought, you know, hey, 2017, like think, you know, ICO craze is going and you're like, here we go. This is mainstream. It's coming. And then it didn't. And then 2020, it's like, here comes mainstream. We're, we're ready for it. And then it's, it, it didn't. And, and so I think that it really showcases just how big the technology is and how many cycles it's really going to take to get that kind of mainstream adoption. And we saw this in web one, and I'm sure you remember, um, you know, for a long time, as you said, you were dialing into individual servers. My, my origin story is the dot com bubble and burst. Uh, yeah. And, and I, I still remember the feeling during the dot com bubble where, you know, everybody was talking about the internet. And while I was sort of downloading Simpson episode scripts on the internet, you know, you realized the opportunity of, of the internet to sort of completely change everything. And everything changed, but it took from 99 at least 10 to 15 years to really yeah. get to where everything is on the internet, right? So 
all of voice communication on the internet, all of your video streaming was on the internet, your phone is on the internet. But it was very hard. You could have people who sort of are visionaries who realized it, but to actually build the system took a couple of cycles and took the dot-com bubble to burst with a lot of people lo losing hope. Um, my biggest, by the way, probably investment stake was selling Apple shares in, uh, in, in the after dot-com bubble burst. Um, but, but it, you know, it took a while to, for Amazon and Google to become Amazon and Google of today. And it's going to take a while. I actually think it, it happened relatively from market cap perspective. You think of the market cap of Ethereum, uh, and, uh, uh and Bitcoin right now, it, it's actually still, very significant compared to where we are in the cycle of our sort of envisioned potential of this ecosystem. Yeah. And, and, and even at a trillion dollars, we're a tiny asset class. I mean, we're, we're so early in this. Um, and I love that perspective of, you know, again, the, the bubbles, you know, rise and burst. And remember, um, these bubbles are dictated by the traditional stock market. You know, that's who's setting the price. So again, we're coming back to the, the statement I made earlier, which is the crypto markets move at four and a half times the speed because it never closes, never shuts down. So it has its positives and negatives, meaning that when there's a downturn, generally crypto is the first to, to feel it. Um, when there's an upturn, generally we're the first to take advantage of it because we just, again, doesn't matter where in the world you are, it doesn't matter, you know, what what access, you know, level of access to the internet you have, whether you're on, you know, on on a Starlink satellite in, in uh, Antarctica or or somewhere in, in South America, you have access to the same coins um, generally almost anywhere in the world. And I think eToro, you you guys yourself, because you're in a hundred countries right now, correct? Correct. I mean, when you truly talk about a global economy, the regulators, you're right, they can't understand, you know, if I make this change in my country, how does this affect the rest of the world? And and then you have, you know, something like Ethereum that came up and it's 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 homeless. There is no headquarters for Ethereum that they can call up and say, hey, we need you to, you know, deal with this audit. It's, uh, it's uh, again, and, and for issuers, right? So again, I think... In, when we look at a trillion dollar market cap, we're looking at all crypto assets, right? Roughly. I don't know if NFTs are in there or not right now, but let's assume they are. I, I, I'm a big believer we'll see that trillion dollars becoming $200 trillion. I agree. But that's not because I think Bitcoin's necessarily going from $20,000 to $2 million. It's because I think what's going to be considered digital assets is going to significantly grow. We're going to see more markets. We're going to see CDBCs, uh, central bank digital currencies, and suddenly you're going to see, you know, on on Ari Toro or, or the digital maybe UN uh, uh, or uh, more actually currencies issued by countries, but that are trading on the blockchain in a transparent way. You're going to see probably bonds eventually trading in that way. You have stock markets all around the world from NASDAQ to AS6 in Australia dealing with how do we transform our business because any exchange, right? So if you're NASDAQ or ASX and your business right now is nine hours a day uh, and you operate only locally, uh, right? You want your business to be 24 hours a day as well, uh, because that means more trading, more revenues, more customers from all around the world in different time zones. So I, th I think people from, again, from central banks to exchanges, to financial institutions from all around the world already understand the opportunity here. Uh, but it, again, I, I just think it's it's going to take time. And there's always a question of exactly how it materializes, uh, which I, I think is always a, a funny story to think about innovation. So you can think about comparing this to Internet uh, sort of 1.0, where you had two things. You had the Internet and you had telecom on the other hand, right? You had yeah. VoIP. And everybody was talking about VoIP being the future and this is going to destroy telecom. But it really didn't like not. We don't. We never switched from our telecom to Skype completely, right? We still usually have our cellular phone data. So, mo, mo, but it's all on the back end right now, based on VoIP. That's based on TCP/IP, UDP, etc. Internet technologies. So, I think eventually we're going to see financial institutions moving to some sort of blockchains. 
uh, which includes the stock exchanges, the banks, the financial services companies, the insurance companies. And we're going to see some sort of, of different version of a CFI DeFi combination there. And, and, and from the other hand, you have a type of innovation which always surprises you because NFT, I remember NFTs in the first cycle. Uh, I remember talking to Vitalik about the concept of NFTs in 2012. Hmm. Uh, we actually, uh, Eddie Toro, we wrote the paper called Colored Coins. Uh, and uh, Vitalik approached me back then in Bitcoin talk and said, hey, this sounds like a very exciting project of tokenizing other assets on top of the Bitcoin network. Can I participate? And Vitalik was the person who actually wrote the first client of uh, an interface on top of Bitcoin, which can then issue different type of colored coins, whether it's a Euro coin or gold coin or IBM coins. Um, and then this was also the beginning of Bitcoin maximalism, uh, because when Vitalik started talking about, uh, uh, let's maybe issue a token for this, uh, and, and then the blasphemy of Vitalik suggesting that he wants to build another blockchain because Bitcoin isn't good enough. Um, and then people were like, uh, you know, ah, we, we, we should only Bitcoin, only Bitcoin, only Bitcoin. But even then people talked about the concept of NFTs. Then you had some NFTs sort of surging with crypto kitties in the first sort of big crypto cycle. And a lot of people still believe, and I'm one of them, that we're going to see also the combination of NFTs with physical art. Right, uh, tokenizing uh, a Picasso uh, uh, and fractionalizing it, but eventually, what took off is apes, and you 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 couldn't expect that, right? So the highest value ecosystem in the NFTs is is, is bored ape yacht club with now a metaverse of of, of bikes. So. Sometimes, actually, innovations need to come from ex extremely unexpected places because that's where that innovation can grow much, much faster than traditional sort of markets. And, and, and I think you exactly hit the nail on the head about why common sense regulation, you know, makes sense. What are the rules? And then let's, let's go hands off and allow the, the entrepreneurs and, and the, the technologists to play. Um, because if you force regulation too early and you, you kind of can pack this in, you don't have the ability for, for things to, to just exist because, oh, we don't want to, we don't want to upend uh, this existing business model. Hey, that industry, they're, they're struggling right now. We don't want to adopt too much change here. Um, but I, jumping back to a point you made, you know, $200 trillion, um, I think that's highly achievable. Achievable, easily achievable as a market cap of, of blockchain overall. In fact, I think it could eventually eat the entire world. Um, not because, you know, Bitcoin's going to go to $10 million a coin, although there's people right now in the background screaming, yes, it will. Um, it's, and, and I hope, I hope, I really do. Uh, I just hope it's not with Zimbabwe money. Um, but, but the concept that you have of tokenizing all real estate, tokenizing all asset, bringing all well, you know, everything into a ledger, which is verifiable, it's trusted, it's auditable. Um, it's just going to take a long time because right now what we have is some very early iterations. And I love the, you know, I, I, I've read the Satoshi's white paper a number of times. I believe in Bitcoin. I think it's it's the greatest innovation that that humanity has, has had in the last uh, you know few decades. But but the reality is what we have today is a very unsafe, unsecured uh, ecosystem. It is uh, fraud is rampant. Uh, people lose their coins very easily with with minor you know you, you you lose a piece of paper. Next thing you know, you have no access. So it's going to take a little bit of time for for the underlying infrastructure to mature enough to allow the regulators and the institutions to say. This is not only better, it's cheaper, faster. Now it's time to upgrade. What, what's kind of the next phase of that, do you believe? I, th I think right now we're sort of, during crypto winter is where a lot of developments usually happen. I, yep. I think if I look at sort of uh, where first crypto, uh, not first, but sort of the big crypto rally of 2017 was really about ICOs, right? It was, it was Ethereum. It was other blockchains. There's an opportunity other than Bitcoin. Uh, and sort of that picked up the entire ecosystem and narrative of blockchain, tokens, ICOs, then becoming IDO, uh, IEOs, then DAOs forming, then IDOs happening, 
Um, I'm a very big believer, by the way, that DAOs are a future, uh, are basically a, a next gen version of a company register, right? 100%. Again, this is even bigger. Th th this is not necessarily bigger or, or smaller, but we think if an entrepreneur, you know, 15, 20 years ago opened a company, they would open, he's in Germany, he would open a German company, German register, meaning a German bank, raising money from Germany VC ecosystem. And if you're not in the right ecosystem, you're stuck. Germany, Israel, US, UK, some others have good ecosystem. If you're not in such an ecosystem, you're, you know, you're in, you said Zimbabwe, you open a Zimbabwe company, you know, I, I don't necessarily want to invest in, in a company and transfer money into a specific account there, not naming one country or another, right? It doesn't matter. Um, just because I'm not from that country. Um, so I think DAOs create sort of, they potentially replace the company's register, right? And enable, people ask me, why are there 22,000? Okay, I get Bitcoin. Why are there 20,000 crypto assets? And I say, because it represents basically a group of people who agree together to do something. Uh, and instead of a a, a, a contract bond between them. There's a smart contract bond between them. Uh, and instead of the money being in a bank, that money can sit in that smart contract as a DAO and they can decide on the voting rights. Uh, instead of writing a 150 page article of association, they write actually a five page code in a smart contract to decide how they're controlling the money. How is the budget enforced? So there's no doubt it's a futuristic view of how to manage a company via code and smart contracts instead of regular contracts. But who is going to be the first country to say, okay, let's no more companies register. Uh, let's get rid of that and let's put a blockchain here and smart contracts here and let's replace the lawyers with people who can audit smart contracts. It's, it's going to take time, but I think what we're seeing is that future is inevitable. Yeah. And I mean, one of the things I can say, and I, I number one, I completely agree. D DAOs will eat the world. Not the iteration that we see today. There's a lot of work that has to happen. Same, same as there was the, the ICO craze and the NFT craze. And, and now there's, you know, version two, version three, there's a lot of, you know, work that has to go into there. Um, with these cycles, I, I'm excited to see kind of the next few iterations of DAOs, NFTs, and, and everything else as they come through with it. But, but the reality is, is that we find ourselves in a very unique place in humanity. The world is incredibly small. Um, you can, you know, again, using technology that we're using today, you're, you're in Israel, I'm in St. Louis, Missouri, um, perfectly clear, 4K, I, we can have an absolute conversation, but the, the distance between us through the financial systems is immense. Um, we can send money back and forth on blockchain. We can do all sorts of things. But if we actually wanted to do business together and have, you know, you know I, I want to pay you a salary as an employee, now we have to go back to an archaic system that was never designed uh, for, for globalization at the scale that we do today. Um, so I, I absolutely love this conversation. Any, any thoughts on that last, uh, last point before we take a pause? No, I, I think, again, it's, it's about, you know, and I think that sort of leads from DAOs into NFTs, right? So NFTs is a culture. So yep. you bring into a world of DeFi, which was all crypto geeks, uh, uh, economy geeks, financial services geeks, uh, uh, building sort of an island of decentralized finance where everybody's building financial tools, but there's no sort of real world uh, creation there, only tools for more tools for more financial tools, which is mind blowing, by the way, from the perspective of where we got in DeFi to suddenly NFTs bringing artists, uh, musicians, DJs, uh, uh, NBA players and, and sports uh, companies like Nike and Louis Vuitton or LVMH and Adidas. So when you think of culture and arts uh, uh, converging together with, a co with an economy, right? With a trillion dollar market cap economy, you basically get together culture, right? That's society. Yeah. Society is the infrastructure of the social economic framework and, and the culture and arts uh, of that society. And, and I think that's sort of where what I would consider sort of that transition into the metaverse, right? So, so in the metaverse is a global village or a, you know, a global villages system 
of people who then operate on, on these ecosystems of shared culture and shared economic framework, but potentially none of them actually live in the same place. Um, and that's a very big shift from an economic point of view going again from a global, uh, uh, from a local village to something that, you know, the world has flattened a bit now to this ecosystem of, of, of villages in the metaverse. And, and obviously we need that economic framework to be able to transact with one another. And I think a second part, which is, you know, something that we really, I think, underestimate is multi-party contracts, yep. right? So if five people want to sign a contract uh, uh, right now, they'll need each of them to agree on the entirety of that contract. And it would be extreme. And then if that group of people who agreed on that contract, therefore became sort of a company, want to do a transaction with another group of people, you'll have one contract between those two companies, right, or DAOs. Uh, but it's very hard to create multi-party computation, right? So I am a customer of Goldman Sachs. I'm a customer of JP Morgan. Uh, I, as eToro, operate with both of them. But if I have an idea to try and do something with both of them, uh, it's impossible. So think about it. If I want to do now a, a deal which involves two large financial institutions, right, and I'm a financial institution, it, it it wouldn't it impossible between yeah. three because I'll need a tri-party agreement. We'll both yeah. in bring the lawyers regulatory like from the get go. My ans the answer from the other side is going to get forget about it. Like it, <laughs> it's, it's so complex we can't do it. So we live today in a world where financial institutions, even look, three financial institutions, can do a contract between them that's innovative. Uh, they can do standard ones. That's uh, there's something called ISDA, right? They can work on fixed APIs, which is something standard. But if three smart financial institutions, smart companies think about, let's do something innovative together, almost impossible. If it's five companies, absolutely impossible, right? So most yep. of the contracts of a company is, is, one, is, is always one-to-one. -one. Now, when a smart contract, suddenly you can create these complex multi-party contracts very easily. And, and I think, you know, people really underestimate the, the potential opportunity of that. I think we're going to look back at this podcast, you know, five years from now and hear one of the very first iterations of, of what this protocol, you know, really becomes. Um, because again, as a business professional for, you know, multiple decades, I can tell you that's exactly needed and it does not work in the space today. And it's, it's a requirement to ensure more safety in third parties. So I love that. Um, Yanni, before we, uh, before we bring it to a close, but let's also talk about one of the biggest, you know, changes that blockchain has brought, you know, to the world, which is impact. Um, and you have a, an amazing, um, you know, uh, uh, investment in, in a company or that you've started called uh, it's actually a non-profit non-profit so uh, yeah please correct me on all this uh social impact um so we so as i mentioned before i started writing uh, uh about trans the needed transparency in the money markets back in 2008 uh and i called it the good dollar uh and, and it, it touched two things one which i think blockchain completely solved for which is the reason you need to have sort of a transparent money system, which is blockchain, uh, where you can see all of the transactions. And the second part, which I think, by the way, becomes super relevant today as we see interest rates. I believe interest rates are uh, bad. Uh, they're bad for society. They make the rich richer and the poor poorer. Uh, so if you have a million dollars, you will get a better interest rate than a person who has a thousand dollars. That's the rate. But by definition, you're also going to get much more. Where if you think about fairness in society, in theory, those who have the less actually need to receive more from the government and not vice versa. So I think the concept of interest rates and everything we're seeing right now that the Federal Reserve and or central banks are doing all around the world, trying to stop the markets to, to stop inflation by increasing interest rates, by uh, forcing people to invest less in innovation and technology and force people who have bought things on debt to capitulate and go bankrupt. I, I think that concept is 
you know, it's economy 1.0. I'm again, I'm a big fan of, of, of uh, economics as a, as a profession, um, but, but I think it relies on a concept where you didn't have yet computers, you didn't have blockchains, and you didn't have transparent money. And the concept of good dollar is, is to create basically universal basic income scheme uh, on uh, the blockchain. So every person in the, in the world can now go to gooddollar.org, open uh, a wallet. So you get a free wallet and every day you can collect good dollars. Um, so you collect every day good dollars um, and there's a smart contract system behind it where we actually, Toro is the main contributor of staking where we stake uh, uh, dies, right? So dollars uh, in ERC-20 form yep. into that smart contract. That smart contract goes and generates yield uh, on yield protocols. Uh, and then that yield is going into the treasury of the good dollar. And that treasury distributes good dollars to everyone. And people can actually convert their good dollars into die. Now, in theory, we did sort of the entire research. If somebody like an Elon Musk or a Mark Zuckerberg uh, would say, okay, let's put a billion dollars into this, uh, this could actually generate basic income for a country because what it does, it sort of scales, right? So the price actually increases as the treasury increases. So if you put a lot of money into it, it creates a lot of yield that yield actually increases the price and that price appreciation appreciates for everybody who's collecting the universal basic income. Uh, so again, it's a, it, we consider it a, a, you know, a research project. I, I, I would be very proud to see it scale on its own or inspire a, a, a similar project sort of scale. But I think what we created in concept is an infrastructure that could work for a billion people where people from all around the world could fund it, right? You don't risk your funds. You just take your funds. You can withdraw them anytime you want. So yep. you just waive your interest rate into this ecosystem for the betterment of all of the people who are collecting that UBI. And, and unsurprisingly, the people who are today, there's, it's, uh, I think it's the third or fourth most popular DeFi app right now. Wow. Uh, so people, there's about 50,000 people every day collecting good dollars, going and collecting good dollars. There are people in Nigeria who are paying for their education by collecting good dollars and then finding people who are willing to pay them for the good dollars. So again, it's a very, we're building it. It's a very small team, a grassroots movement, you know, trying to, we're just sort of sponsoring the research of it. But I think that, that's an example of something that could have never been done prior to blockchain that if successful in this form or another can solve a lot of economic problems in the world, right? So detaching the creation of UBI from government yep. uh, and from being local to something that potentially could be global. Um, and again, and creating an ecosystem eventually of smart contracts. So people who connected to food trucks or education in Nigeria can take a more advantage of it. Uh, by the way, it's Nigeria, Vietnam, Venezuela, uh, uh, I think top three out of top five countries using the good dollar. So you really see people are using it. And it's not a lot, by the way, when you collect good dollars, you collect like 20 to 50 good dollars a day, which are about two cents, right? So it's really micro payments in that sense. They, they, they said that about Bitcoin uh, in early in early 2010, I got to tell you. So it's not not too dissimilar than what we've already been dealing with. You know, I, Yanni, I love, love, love what you guys are doing. And I, I want to point out something to the viewers that that the idea of universal basic income is is not Yanni's. You didn't you didn't invent this term. But the and, and many people have tried this governments, many agencies, Red Cross, you name it. This has been a big thing. How do you distribute funds? Um, and, and what we've seen and I'm not not pointing at any political party or any country or any organization, um, but generally in large sums, less than thirty percent of the initial amount of money donated to an you know to an organization actually gets to those that that need it. Um, what what would you guess your your efficiency level is uh, on Good it's, Dollar? It, it, it's it's actually it's more than a hundred percent, right? Because yeah, we put in. A, a, a million dollars into the good dollar smart contract. Those million dollars already distributed 
more than $200,000 for people who collect the UBI, and we still have those million dollars there, right? So, it, it, so, so it's actually generating because it's the yield that's being distributed eventually to people. So, and we still have our hundred percent of our own funds because it's just stake there. I, I think that this absolutely does and can and will scale. And I'm really excited to kind of get involved in, in so many of the things that, that you guys and Etoro are doing because, um, you know, one of the things in the space, it, it does rapidly evolve. New people show up every single day with new concepts, new ideas. And, and the, the greatest concepts that Web3 is going to take Web3 to mainstream most likely haven't even been conceptualized yet. I mean, we're so early in the cycle. Right. But I can tell you one thing uh, from, from me myself, I talk to a lot of people every day about this. Um, hearing you speak and hearing your understanding of where the technology is and where it, where it, what it's is capable of today, but where it also needs to go um, is really, again, I'm, I'm ex so excited to, to be able to speak to you about these things and hear your perspectives because anyone that's listening that's interested in cryptocurrencies or financial markets um, really should spend some time on eToro because you've taken that knowledge and you've actually translated to a very usable platform. Um, and, and I play around with it all the time. I'm not ready to uh, have anyone copy trade me yet because um, <laughs> I am I am not a uh, financial, uh, you know, I, like I, I play a lot. My biggest, my biggest biggest win last year was Dogecoin. So that, that, that just goes to show you how well I do. I, yeah, it was I a surprise it. for me, by the way. I, 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 I was, to me, it was, I was a hundred percent. I knew it was happening. I, I put $5,000 in at about three cents cashed out at 65 cents, you know, right at the eve of the Saturday night live thing. I'm like, I'm out. I'm done. This is, it's not going to go well after this. So I'm, I'm uh, wondering by the way, whether now that Elon is buying Twitter, whether he's going to embed something like Dogecoin into Twitter, because if that happens, 100%. that's very interesting. I, I, and that's I, something I've learned, by the way, around crypto is it, it, the value of a cryptocurrency is the amount of people transacting it, volume and the fire uh, power or the dry powder that that community has. But it's that community on average. So if you have somebody who's the richest person in the world, who's a part of that community, uh, that can have a big impact on the price of a coin, even if it started as a joke. Yeah, no, and 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 it's more secure than most than most national currencies. So while, <laughs> while we uh, we may not approve of some things, but I, I absolutely love it. Uh, Yanni, I, this is you're the easiest person to to find and get a hold of. You've got eToro, you've got a number of platforms around there. Um, but is there is there any kind of uh, final comments or or things as as we head out? Uh, no, I, I think you know we're always happy uh, to help people get educated about uh, both crypto and stocks. We just recently launched our DeFi also, so I know this podcast a lot about Web three. Uh, so through our Delta app, which is our portfolio okay. tracker, which enables you to connect, so you can actually work in Etoro as CFI, which is the main Etoro app, or you can actually connect, download Delta, and connect your Coinbase. Kraken, Binance, Robinhood wow. account to actually uh, uh, and your MetaMask account to track both of your financial assets as well as manage your NFTs across Ethereum, Polygon, Avalanche. So we took an approach of sort of looking at DeFi and CeFi a bit separately and constantly now we're building those bridges in between eToro is CeFi and Delta by eToro as access to DeFi. Yanni, you're an amazing uh, DGen. I absolutely love it. Uh, y Wells, uh, this is Yanni, eToro, and again, wealth of knowledge here. And we'll, we'll uh, catch up with you again really soon, hopefully on Fireside. Be good. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you very much.